Hello everyone, this is Sashank Modi from the Center for Automotive Research. We are here for the webinar on structural bonding for multi-material lightweight vehicles. And it's one o'clock right now. Uh, there are people joining in. So we'll just wait one minute or two and then we will start. Okay. I hope everybody can see the screen. If you cannot, you have a chat box there. You can type in. Okay, uh, Okay. I think I have, we have most of the people joined in. Again, this is Shashank Modi from the Center for Automotive Research. We are here for the webinar on structural bonding for multi-material lightweight vehicles. Today we have uh, uh, very good speakers from two different companies. Uh, but before that, I just want to give you a brief overview of CAR. We are a non-profit 501c3 research organization based in Ann Arbor, Michigan. We do research on automotive te technologies and uh, all the way from uh, materials to manufacturing. And we also have uh, uh, groups with, which does research on labor and economics and then uh, autonomous vehicles and urban planning. So today uh, we are here for uh, the Structural Materials uh, webinar. We have three speakers. The first one, we, we're going to start with Arthur, who is a senior TSD specialist at Dow DuPont, especially the products. And followed by him will be uh, speakers from Henkel. Those include uh, Dalton, he's an application engineer and, uh, in powertrain and e-mobility department at Henkel, and Brooke. She is e-mobility business development manager in acoustics and structural solutions at Henkel Corporation. And uh, bef uh, before uh, giving the control to Dalton and Brooke, uh, Juliana uh, will uh, introduce the, uh, the Henkel products and she is the VP of uh, structural solutions at Henkel. So with that, I'm gonna give Arthur the control and we'll begin with our first presentation. So, Arthur, I'm making you the presenter right now. Okay, we can see your screen. Perfect. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Art Colley from uh, Dow DuPont. Uh, we Uh, Arthur? Yeah. Oh, I'm yeah. trying. Can everyone hear? I'm trying to get rid of this thing. Can everyone? Yeah, we can see the screen. Okay. All right. Well, we're just going to address a few of the trends, right? Lightweighting in the automotive industry, mostly driven by fuel economy, right? We started out with super lightweight vehicles. Uh, we've added a lot of content, a lot of structure to these material the cars. And now we're uh, seeing that, you know, a group of different materials, um, different steels, different composites uh, will drive the uh, weight down in these vehicles as and also drive it up performance and stiffness. <clears throat> why Why do we need uh, weight savings, right? Um, really, it has to do a fuel economy, right? This is nothing new for anyone, I'm sure, right? Um, and uh, here's a breakdown of the uh, consumption for miles per gallon, right? So the biggest thing is the drivetrain, but drivetrain won't be able to get us to where we need to go. So we have to do other things, right? We have to uh, reduce mass and enable to make the 
the targets that are outlined here, right, between now and 2025. So one of the things that we have done seen a lot with is, is carbon fiber, right? Carbon fiber is a good, high stiff, stiffness and strength and low mass, right? Comparing it to steel and other things, right? The issues are, right, it's, it's high cost. Um, there are some people out there that are focusing on trying reducing this cost, you know, as opposed to a woven product is maybe chopped carbon fiber and optimizing the epoxy matrix to fix these, uh, these things, right? So here's a few different things, right? So you can see where carbon fiber has, you know, excellent stiffness, uh, low density, and good to high strength, comparing it to like, you know, different stuff like steel or magnesium or even aluminum. So we even see this today, right? There's a, a, a large mix of different materials of using high strength steel, ultra high strength steel, and you know, regular mild steel, like in the uh, new Gulf, or in like yeah, other things, right? That have gone all aluminum, like the Ford F-150 and the Audi A6, but they're, uh, they're far and few between. And there's a much better idea is to use a, a blend of composites or a blend of different metals and using their properties in the specific regions where they're necessary. So why, uh, how to do the joining, right? So we have a few different technologies, right? In our body shop, we have a number of one component or two component structural epoxies that could be used that use the advantage of the eco process to cure these adhesives. Uh, they're able to be applied in the body shop over oily metal and uh, oily or steel or aluminum. Um, as we know, right, the carbon fiber really doesn't really want to go through these type of processes where they would use the trim shop. So that's where we are, our uh, beta force structural polyurethane technology would be used. We see that being used in currently in some carbon fiber structure like the BMW i3 or i8 or uh, a lift gate for Mercedes as well as some other module type bonding, right? Like where we would see like a, a lightweight lift gate that could be added into the process downstream in the assembly plant. That's made it a tier where all the fastening is done at the tier one, as opposed to having to uh, clog up or, you know, use up the space in the OEM's facility. So, Joining techniques, right? What do they bring, right? They do increase stiffness, right? Uh, adhesive, adhesive beads, just in general, provide reinforcement and stiffening across the whole bond line, as opposed to uh, point loaded with using a mechanical fastener or a uh, weld. All the focus is, all the force is focused at the weld or at the mechanical fastener. Uh, what you can also gain with composite materials is a design flexibility, right? It's a lot easier to injection mold a complex part than it would be to stamp a complex part. Um, like you said, like I said before, the increased uh, energy management across the continuous bottom line and improves safety. Uh, it, it gets the overall need. What we're looking for is uh, weight reduction. And also, a lot of times you can integrate, you know, maybe three metal parts into one composite part. And um, hopefully it reduces a lot of mass and it also speeds up things and also with the need of less tooling can really uh, make things a lot more affordable. Here's just a brief uh, depiction of our portfolio, right? We have a number of adhesives across our portfolio that span a number of moduli as well as uh, elongation. So there's the two things where you, we always fight is, is stiffness and strength versus elongation. There's some times where 
we don't need a very strong product and we need a lot of elongation or we're, we need something that's very, very strong and elongation is not really that much of an issue, especially with the uh, rubber toughened and the toughened epoxy systems, right? Toughness is much more important than elongation and there's other ways to uh, get at that as opposed to uh, making stuff really elastic. So we have a, 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 a large portfolio of adhesives, that's all I would really like to say, is, and pre treatment solutions for bonding a number of substrates and a number of different substrates together. Because, you know, the differences of the CLT mismatches, like especially when you're going from aluminum to steel or composite to aluminum or composite to steel, are great. And adhesive technology is, is super good to make up those differences and uh, dissipate those stresses. So what we sort of do in the uh, applications development space is we like to tailor the adhesive performance for the application, right? Where is the adhesive going to be applied? How big of an adhesive footprint do you really have? What does the substrate um, adhesion characteristics look like? Do you have a large part where you need a, like a large open time so you can have some latent curing? Um, do you need stiffness? Do you need uh, uh, energy absorption? Do you need higher modulus or lower modulus? Is it going to be statically loaded? Are there you know environmental concerns? Is it going to be close to uh, more close to the uh, let's say the engine compartment where it's going to see some higher heat? Um, other things we can do with the adhesive is Tailor the acceleration. Can we <clears throat> heat the part uh, to accelerate the cure in maybe some spots to hold it together so you don't need any secondary fasteners? Um, in our portfolio, we've seen a, a, a robust adhesion to a number of polar, nonpolar, <clears throat> composite materials like carbon fiber, polyacetal materials such as uh, our nylons, as well as a number of different metallic substrates, whether it's magnesium, uh, regular steel, aluminum, or high-strength steel. <coughs> um, here's just a few applications that we have, uh, we're currently using. Right now, most of these are based in Europe. Um, so there's a, a roof of aluminum and steel and carbon fiber um, for that, for the car, as well as on the Mercedes. We have a tailgate. And uh, one of the really big ones uh, for, for uh, carbon fiber bonding is the uh, BMW i series, right? So the i3 and the i8 are all carbon fiber intensive uh, vehicles. The occupant compartment, which they call the life cell, is completely bonded with our adhesives. Uh, we also have a few other in the Audi and the... Uh, as well as, you know, these are all carbon fiber, steel, and aluminum materials, as well as some nylon materials that we use the adhesive, like I said, to make up these mismatches in thermal expansion. Um, so just a few examples to, to, to highlight, you know, the Mercedes SL Roadster, the, uh, the closure, the uh, trunk lid, right? We use our Betaforce 2850S, which is fast curing, high modulus adhesive to bonding the uh, carbon fiber inner and outer parts. You know, this was uh, some ultralight materials that helped really reduce 40% weight compared to the steel structure. And we this was all bonding with uh, uh, carbon fiber and SMC. It is fast, fast, uh, Curing, right? We use some uh, local IR keating to heat the corners to hold the part while the rest of the adhesive cures at room temperature. Uh, a more detailed look in the uh, BMW i8. In the uh, top right hand corner, there's a YouTube video which BMW has graciously put on YouTube to show the application of the adhesive and the quick curing of the adhesive. Uh, so after this thing, you can go look that up and go see how it's done. <clears throat> so what really happens is the uh, adhesive is applied to both body sides. It's brought to the body itself. It's uh, held there. 
Um, they use some IR lights in the four corners and two top. So in three minutes, they get the uh, handling strength they need to hold the body together so it can be moved on to the next st station. Uh, we also had this, uh, it was a large development rate. The TG and the uh, Young's modules had to be within these, these operating ranges to enable to uh, perform well in the stiffness and the performance of this vehicle. Um, here's one, here we have our North America that has been going on for a little over almost two years now, right? The uh, Jeep Cherokee, and this will also go for the Honda uh, RDX as well. Uh, the composite lift gate. The uh, uh, composite lift gate. Can you go yes. back one slide? I just have a quick quick question on uh, sure, no problem. the last one. Uh, it says three minutes of IR heat curing and after one hour of ambient cure. So is that... Uh, That's will be full cure. Fun? Okay. Okay. Yep. And so there, that will be after the one hour, you get the 8.8 8 MPA, right? In full cure, in 24 hours, you'll have the 8 megapascals. Okay. So the composite lift gate is, is the, uh, the Jeep Cherokee as well as the uh, Honda RDX, right? There's a, a, a LGF PP inner and a TPO outer. Uh, we use our, let's say, a more flexible adhesive to bond the inner and outer because there is a large mismatch in the CLT of both the uh, LGF PP, which is uh, 30 percent glass filled or 40 percent glass filled compiled to the talc filled outer <clears throat> so the materials are flame treated and primed and adhesively bonded uh, this has a cycle time of just under three minutes uh, it's very important to note we use the IR heating as well in a, a few different sections and in one hour we have our uh, at room temperature we'll have our handling strength for the whole part but in three minutes, we're able to move the part to the next location. Uh, the, the good thing about this as well is, right, it saved about 40% of weight savings compared to steel. It was very, very easy for the OEM to switch to this. Uh, it's also sequenced in body color and performed trim level to the OEM. So they, uh, the parts are unloaded at the OEM and then just bolted right online. Uh, as a completed lift gate, color matched to the uh, master. All right. so, uh, that's it for me, and I'd like to thank you very much. Um, thanks, Arthur. Before we uh, move on to the next presentation, so you talked about this IR cure, and it's it's uh, under three minutes. So I just have a quick question: that do do you need fastness to hold the part till for that those three minutes? No, they are held in a bonding fixture for the three minutes, okay. and no, no external fasteners are necessary. Now, the, I have seen some applications where they use some fasteners, where they let the adhesive cure at room temperature, but it's really up to you, or the OEM and the design. Um, one thing we do know is, right, we don't like to use fasteners in composite type materials because over time, a fastener is going to uh, be an area where a crack is going to propagate. Exactly. Yeah. 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 It uh, it destroys the continuous fiber as well. Absolutely. Yeah. And it, like I said, it just nothing put a, a flaw in the composite material, and it over time, it's just a place for a crack to start, squeak to start, and uh, lower performance. Okay. Hey. Uh, thanks, Arthur, and uh, for the people online who are listening to this webinar, uh, if you have any questions, you have. Uh, chat box and question box, I think, where you can type your uh, questions. And then at the end of the two presentations, we will uh, we will have a Q&A where we can pick up some of those questions. So uh, please uh, keep them coming. And now I'm going to have Hankel present their presentation. And for that, uh, Sean, can you make me the presenter again.
Ruby Dalton, are you can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, let me do it for the screen. Okay. Just tell me next slide and I will change it. All yours. Okay. Um, we can go ahead and start. Juliana, are you on the call? All right. Well, we can go ahead and get started here. Um, so talking a little bit about structural bonding for battery electric vehicles. Um, and then just in terms of who we are as Hankel, so you can go to the next slide here. So at Hankel, we have three different divisions, as you can see, adhesive technologies, um, also capitalizing on our capabilities, you know, with also beauty care and laundry and home care. Um, but within our particular segment, obviously more so focused on the adhesive technology side. Um, go ahead to the next slide. Next slide, sorry. And then within, oh, go ahead and go back, sorry. Must be a little bit of a lag. Um, so there are five different business areas within our adhesive technology division. Um, as you can see here, we have our AI group. This is our packaging and consumer goods. We also have departments with general industry, electronics, um, and then just different consumer, craftsmen, and building different types of components. And again, kind of filtering down more so into our adhesive technologies, we fall into our transport and metal section. So myself and Eugene um, work heavily within this particular segment. Um, you can move to the next one. Myself and Dalton here, sorry. Um, and then in terms of um, you know who we are, we have a very unique portfolio that we provide multiple different types of solutions, as you can see here, between adhesive, sealants, and coatings, um, with over 40 different types of technologies. And our focus really is on customization and efficient solutions. We have extensive experience in being able to provide that experience to be that much more effective with future programs, looking at it from a global perspective, and being a leader with this technology in our, our product portfolio. Um, you can go ahead and go to the next slide here. Um, and this is where Dalton will talk a little bit more about our mixed material usage. So Dalton, go on ahead. Yes. So as we know, many companies have been forecasting the change from the standard of internal combustion engines to EV body structures. So with that being said, we know that adding a vehicle will increase the weight dramatically. Since we're now increasing the weight of the total vehicle, we need to find ways to reduce it in other places. This is why introducing structural adhesives instead of using fasteners is so important moving forward. I'll go into a little bit more detail on this on the next slide, but I would just like you to look at these two pie charts comparing material usage, um, back one, sorry, the material usage of EV body structures for, um, for 2010 versus 2040. In 2010, we had a focus on mild and high strength steel. We believe that everything in the vehicle needed to be supported by a steel frame or body. Well, this is not the case anymore, as we know. So by 2040, the market will be focused on everything but mild and high-strength steel. Aluminum and composite materials will make up most of the vehicles with additional substrates like boron and magnesium. Next slide. So this slide goes in a little bit more detail on why we'd rather have structural bonding in our electric vehicles. Well, the graph on the left shows how a Loctite bonded joint can hold up longer and will have more strength than your standard spot weld or pop rivet. This is because you're distributing the load across the entire joint rather than concentrating it like fasteners. And not only is adhesive stronger, but using structural bonding can be more design flexible. You're able to use multiple substrate designs. It gives you the opportunity to introduce those plastics and composites into your application. As you can see in the joint area figure on the right side of the screen, we are comparing width versus overlap. Both samples A and B have the same bond area of one square inch. Well, the key point here is that your joint width of your design is more important than your overlap. 
you will get the highest strength from your sample B because wider is better when using structural adhesives. Next slide. So these next few slides will be on structural bonding for power storage, power generation, and then power conversions of a battery electric vehicle. Next slide. So what chemistries do we mean when we discuss structural bonding? Well, as we know, all chemistries have their advantages and disadvantages when it comes to bonding. First, we have our two-part acrylics. These products are also known as MMAs. A great benefit to this chemistry are the quick fixture times. These products have a great cure through depth because they're statically mixed through a nozzle. Two-part acrylics will offer you high strength and impact resistance at a range of different temperatures. But one thing you should consider when using these products is the odor that they give off. They can be somewhat pungent sometimes, so you need to take that into account. And we do offer some non-odor MMAs as well. Next, we have our one and two-part epoxies. Epoxies are known for their excellent fluid resistance and toughness. One part epoxy is generally need a heat cure, while the two part epoxy can be mixed and cured at room temperature. Epoxies are like two part acrylics because they bond very well to plastic and metal substrates. This chemistry offers you high strength and a rigid bond. The trade off here, though, is they don't have great elongation like some of the other chemistries do. And then the final chemistry, we have our polyurethane, also known as PUs in the market. Polyurethanes have a very high cohesive bond strength. They can survive in polar and non-polar solvent environments, like water, light bulb, all the way to motor oil. They have the right combination of your strength and elongation. One downside to the polyurethane chemistry, though, is that they have a limited depth of cure. Next slide. So this is just a short list of the structural adhesives Henkel has to offer, as well as offering impact and strength resistance these adhesives also provide the fluid and environmental resistance you need for your application. All these products are available to sample, so please feel free to reach out to me after this uh, webinar. My job is to work with you to find the correct adhesive that will fit your strength and cycle time requirements. The next slide will focus on Loctite UK 6800. This is our uh, mostly recent developed product. Next slide. So structural bonding with heat management. Loctite UK 6800 is a two component polyurethane adhesive. Typical customer recommendations are around one watt per meter K when it comes to thermally conductive adhesives. UK 6800 offers almost double that with 1.9 watts per meter K. Pretty impressive for a structural adhesive. Not only does this product have high thermal conductivity, it can also bind to multiple substrates with high strength and good elongation like I discussed earlier with the polyurethane chemistry. This product will be great applications like your module to pack or your cells to cooling plate. It is designed for mass production assemblies as well. And now I'm gonna hand it back to Brooke to talk to you about structural binding for body and white applications. Thank you. Thank you, Dalton. Um, you can go to the next slide, yeah. So I'm gonna talk a little bit more about structural bonding for the body and white unit. And we know this is becoming of more and more importance, especially for battery electric vehicles. We are trying to not only meet these low weight requirements, but at the same time, we are challenged to also meet strict crash safety performance requirements at the same time. So we have the challenge of looking for lightweight alternatives, meeting strict crash safety performance requirements, and of course, looking for the lower cost options. So quite a few challenges, and with these challenges in mind, Tinkle is excited to announce one of our latest alliances. So you can go on to the next slide here. So Hinkle recently formed a strategic alliance with Arley International. And um, I'll pivot for a second here to talk about Arley. Arley is one of the world's leading development technology and consultation service providers. Um, they have over 30 years of experience in global projects and over 2,000 engineers and specialists. So the goal here is for us to come to the platform with our material science expertise and then capitalize on Arley International's engineering expertise and bring these two backgrounds together to be more strategic and supportive of our customers as they go throughout their design. 
we can go ahead to the next slide here. So how this works is that we are able to provide engineering teams. So we will have a design release engineer that is designated to your program and they help support in terms of design. And then we also have a program manager who helps to kind of make sure that the program health is in a good state throughout the program life as you have your different milestones. And then also having a launch engineer or an application engineer, someone that is on site able to support with quality or design questions or anything that they can do to help really support any of your needs that are happening on the plant. This global network is really to support with our latest technology, providing faster turnaround times and full digital integration. We know with the trends that we're talking about today with mixed material compatibility and the need for lightweight targets, it is imperative to have this expertise in both engineering strategy and chemical formulation because we really want to capitalize on our latest research for lightweight technology. Uh, the next slide, please. So our alliance creates two platforms, as you see here, one focused on advanced solutions and the other looking at this global digital engineering model. And the goal here really is to generate new concepts in design and material sciences. So how this works is we review the prototype designs using simulation data that's grounded in both our molecular understanding as well as our component behavior understanding to really optimize these designs in this prototype phase. It is critical to review these designs in the early stages of the full vehicle development, which I'll probably say a few times on this webinar, um, but it is very important to be able to capitalize on those opportunities with that initial design. And then, of course, with knowing the need for quick turnaround time and speed, we also have our engineering cycle working with back office hubs, working 24 hours a day, reviewing these simulations and making sure we can come to you with a quicker response time to support with your designs. Uh, next slide, please. So to talk about this a little bit better, um, I'll briefly talk about this study that we did. It was really for proof of concept here. And Hankel and Arlie worked together to make this pilot engineering project using an electric SUV. So um, within this slide here, you can see uh, kind of how this study worked. So the study included engineers from both companies fully collaborating and developing lightweight solutions for this concept car in the early design stage. So to give you some specs about this vehicle in particular, um, it contained about 75% aluminum, 25% steel, as you can see here. The body and white baseline weighed around 431 kilograms, and overall weight around 2,500. Um, so our goal here and our focus was on, of course, decreasing the overall weight, but also maintaining the safety requirements um, that are needed. So moving to the next slide here. So I'm going to kind of um, jump a little bit to the end, and then I'll explain the means. Um, so, you know, we were really excited, as you can see, of course, we were able to provide this 42 kilogram weight savings using multiple solutions, which I'll talk about in a second. Again, it's important to note that, you know, these types of results may not have been achieved if the solutions were applied after, you know, later car design development. To achieve full potential, it really is imperative to incorporate these solutions into the body and weight design. So our solutions have you know, multiple options, you know, with our adhesives, but also with our support with our structural hybrid parts, which I'll talk about in a, in a slide in a little bit here. And the structural hybrid parts or our structural inserts are meant to replace this heavier metal sections that we're seeing. Um, in addition to that, we also support with the engineering side to really fully optimize those designs to find lightweight alternative mechanisms as well. So moving to the next slide here, I'll talk a little bit about those structural inserts. There we go. Okay, so this is what the structural insert looks like. And to give you an idea, you can see this green section that's the carrier, and that's actually fiber reinforced plastic. And then it has this, this structural foam, and these are highly um, high performance structural foams. And how it works is the fiber reinforced plastic is acting as a solid frame carrier. 
and you're going to have the structural foam injected into predefined sections of that part. So the foam is then going to expand in the e-code oven, and this is creating a stiff connection between the hybrid structure and then other parts of the body and light unit. This particular foam that was used in the study is one of our Terrasone EP materials, developing, you know, delivering high strength and stiffness at an extremely low weight. Um, it is, you know, resistant to normal automotive washing, phosphating solutions, and electronic coating, and curing usually within 15 minutes on um, passing through the e coat oven. So compared to all metal platforms, this really allows for flexibility and freedom in your design uh, to support um, each particular structure, adapting that design according to the structure. So this one, for example, is a pillar um, component part. So each design is fully engineered and optimized by both Hinkle and RLE for all crash load scenarios. We're looking to find that perfect balance between deformation and stiffness. You want to be able to have the crash energy absorbed by deformation of the part, but on the other hand, the part needs to be stiff enough to direct that energy accordingly. So going to the next slide here, um, very briefly, I'll just talk about some of this analysis and the results we were able to achieve to give you a better idea of what I mean. So looking here, you can see the roof crush test, which is looking to evaluate the pillars. So in the pillars, for example, we reduced the weight, as you can see, by 5.4 kilograms. And we did this by optimizing the thickness of the sections of the A and B pillar reinforcement areas. And then in addition, you can see we added in, in the red here, hybrid structural parts or our structural inserts in the weak areas where the body started crippling. And on top of that, the goal with the roof crush test is to have a strength to weight ratio above four. And as you can see here, we were able to meet that requirement at 5.1. But again, pointing out that there's multiple mechanisms happening here. We're reviewing the design to ensure that we can capitalize on that design. We're reviewing it with structural inserts to support those weaker areas. And then, of course, we have other solutions such as our adhesives that help to capitalize on that strength requirement and really support us in this study. Uh, the next slide, please. So this other example that I'll talk about is a small overlap test. And this is to evaluate areas such as the front bumper bar and inner sill. And again, we reduce the thickness of those sections once more from three millimeters to two millimeters, um, also capitalizing with the design by changing some of the rocker rib geometry. And then in addition to that, we added in some hybrid structural parts. As you can see, you know, there's one in the front bumper and one in the rocker. Um, and again, you know, able to achieve weight savings. We're looking at, you know, taking off 3.6 kilograms while maintaining that requirement of having a wall intrusion below 150 millimeters. So we were excited to see, you know, these are just a couple of examples, but excited to see how we can really optimize these designs in multiple different ways. There's multiple mechanisms while also meeting those requirements. Uh, next slide, please. So this is just kind of an overall slide again, you know, really um, looking at all of our different options, especially with mixed material compatibility in mind. Um, I know we've mentioned that a few times, and we have you know, multiple adhesives to address numerous material joining mechanisms supporting these crash performance criteria. Um, you can see we were able to greatly reduce with the amount of welding spots and rivets while maintaining that performance criteria. And we actually have quite a few OEMs that are using these types of solutions. Um, on a global scale of replacing the traditional steel reinforcements with the structural inserts to really capitalize on that lightweight opportunity. Um, so the, the last slide here, um, you know, we're again really excited about this alliance in terms of being able to provide Hinkle's best in class material science and RLE's expertise within engineering. Um, we want to provide this competitive synergy for our customers to enable you to be that much more successful with this next generation of designs, as well as new levels of light weighting. Of course, passenger safety is of utmost importance, and we want to be able to do that with faster turnaround times. Um, there's development centers with the US, United Kingdom, uh, Australia, just to name a few. I mean, we are very much so well positioned to implement this technology. 
uh, with close proximity to our customer locations around the world. I'm very excited, and with that, that is all that I have. And if there's any questions, Dalton and I are happy to support him with those questions. Okay. Uh, thank you, Brooke and Dalton. And I just want to remind uh, everybody online that you have a chat box where you can type your questions. But be uh, yeah, so we have few coming in, and uh, I want to throw in a general question first for you know uh, all three of you. And you know, in both presentations, we have seen numerous applications of structural adhesives in the reinforcement and in the roof structure and pillars and in, in general in the uh, dissimilar mixed material body in white. So, you know, what goes into the decision-making process for adhesive selection for each application? Like what's what's the flow chart? How do you select, how do you narrow down on which adhesive you want to use? So, uh, Arthur, you want to go first? Sure. Um, first, we would take a look at the requirements the specification requirements for the the application, right? How strong does it have to be? Uh, if there's a stiffness requirement, is there a type of an elongation requirement? Um, what is it meant to be doing? Are we looking to dissipate load? Are we looking to, um, just like I said, the overall performance of the project? So that will narrow the scope down uh, a little bit. Then where is it going to be applied? Is it going to be applied in the body shop or trim shop? Is it going to be need to be fast, fast cured, or because have some extra time for it to cure. And then those application questions were really focuses down to a few candidates. And then from that point, we can um, focus our efforts in testing on a few different selected categories, categories of adhesives, as opposed to the whole portfolio. So really knowing the application demands and performance requirements, and more importantly, or as important, the application is uh, really, really focuses us on the right adhesive for the job. Okay. Um, Brooke, Dalton? Yeah, and, and Arthur really uh, r really hit all the points. Uh, I mean, it, should, it really comes down to, uh, we look at the application directly, we pick the adhesive based on the customer's parameters, um, we realized that some adhesives work better in fluid than others. Some work better at high and low temperatures than others. Um, so we take everything into account, and then we give our customers the best recommendation uh, based on the adhesives that we have. Um, some cases that we actually um, develop adhesives directly for customers. So. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, uh, we have a question from uh, the audience here, and this is for Hanko. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the tarot core patches and where can we get more information from? Uh, sure. I mean, I can talk about that. Um, any information, you know, that there ever is, I mean, feel free, of course, to reach out. It, it helps to know um, the specific application. Um, my email address, I, I believe, you know, was shown and we can discuss more. Um, is there a, I, I guess it will be difficult to, to answer, but I'm curious if there's a specific application or a specific question that they are interested in, in terms of manufacturing um, or strengths. But if, if there's any sort of um, mechanical question or characteristic, um, we have a significant amount of information online. We have our TDSs online, and they, um, state a little bit more about what those characteristics look like and how it can support your application. Okay. Yeah, I, I will. I will share your contact information uh, to with everybody who is online, so so that they can they can contact uh, you know the the right person if they, they need uh, more information. Okay. And I, I think okay. uh, your websites have de uh, some details as well. So um, um, and. I have a question for Hankel. You talked about your uh, partnership with RA Lee, and uh, uh, you know you guys have developed this ESUV, which is uh, I, I think a mixed material vehicle with with steel and aluminum, and uh, you have composite as as reinforcement. 
So f first of all, uh, I may have missed it. Is what is there a baseline for this vehicle, or you developed it from scratch, or did you like convert already existing vehicle into a? One of the slides um, talks about it a little bit more. Um, right after um, kind of introducing, so I believe it's slide 15 if that shows, but. Um, or yeah, here, maybe I can slides. jump in, please. Okay. Yeah. Um, so it was a um, um, vehicle um, from uh, a Chinese. OEM that in the end never made it to the market, but it was the final design. So we basically took an existing um, body and vehicle design and um, looked at it from the perspective, okay, if we would start that producing that vehicle from scratch and designing in um, lightweighting solutions as design intent instead of making them a fix, which is the case uh, with most of, of the applications today still, um, what could we get out? Yeah, by thinking differently in terms of how we design. Okay. But we're happy to and, yeah, uh, share more information on that one individually. Okay. Okay. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I believe uh, like this initiative is very heavy on simulation and getting, uh, getting the initial design right. So uh, what are some of the big challenges with simulation that you have faced with adhesive and with mixed material, um, you know the one big challenge that Arthur talked about is the CLTE difference uh, between between materials, and that causes some problems in the paint shop because of the bake oven. And adhesives can mitigate some of those, but can can you predict how how much uh, how much that particular adhesive will be able to compensate for that difference? Um, it would depend on the application, but yes, I mean we have the material cards that we use are meant to really support those kinds of questions with knowing the different characteristics to really be able to give that future projection and know how the interface is going to behave. But it would depend, of course, on each situation. Okay. okay. Uh, Arthur? Yeah, I agree. Um, it will depend on the situation. You know, we we do we take a large time in, it, in, the, autom in the adhesive industry, right? characterizing our materials so those uh, inputs can be fed back into a model so that you get an accurate representation of what's going to be going on. So um, with the test methods that are out there, the ASTM and ones that we have uh, also uh, looked at, uh, we try to take that and we have a engineering staff on, on site. You know, we have a uh, person who is uh, very well respected in this industry. It helps mm -hmm. our customers um, deal with the issues that adhesives bring to right models and how to use to select the right elements and how to uh, accurately categorize those elements to get the best data from CAE. Okay. Um, yeah, that's, that's good. Uh, we have another question coming in from the audience and this is on uh, the quality of uh, adhesive bead. How do you ensure that you know the the, the continuous uh, bead that you're putting in for the adhesive is within the spec? Uh, are there any uh, NDE methods available? Uh, what are there any vision techniques? What, what what has been used in the industry to make sure the uh, quality is uh, is at par with the standard? Yeah, so usually in the industry, uh, we have a camera that follows the robot and it sees any uh, informities of the bead. If it actually, like, if, if it gets too big or too small, it actually shuts down the system completely. Um, sometimes there's little air pockets or something that catches that system and it shuts down the system. So usually, like, a camera that, that has a laser uh, system on it that, that follows that, that robotic dispense. And as soon as it, it sees something, it, it stops. Okay. okay. Yeah, that, I agree. The use of vision systems is is key. Uh, we also have some of our adhesives and or primers that have like maybe a, a UV tracer in there, and where you could use a, a UV source to make sure that the product is in the correct location. Also, uh, working with our 
partners like um, uh, application development or the adhesive uh, dispense companies, right? They have uh, very sophisticated systems to ensure that the correct amount of adhesive is coming out of the both uh, both parts of it's like a two part and uh, making sure it's uh, mixed properly. Another reason why we know sometimes we use two different colors of the uh, adhesive resin and hardener, right? So when you see when they're mixed that you get like, you know, uh, a homogeneous color. Uh, and if you, it's not mixed homogeneous, you usually can see some amount of striations in the adhesive as well. Okay. And, and we're also part of a, a, another um, part where they was using, try to look at, uh, let's say x-rays or even anything like that for some non-destructive techniques as well uh, out there. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, another co uh, question coming from the audience and also from me that uh, I, I was reading a white paper and uh, it was, I think, from the Ducker report. Uh, and it says that in 2018, 2017, uh, around that time frame, the average linear fate of adhesive in a vehicle is like 68 to 72. That's the range. And uh, BMW 7 Series, uh, 492 feet of adhesive. Cadillac CT6, 591 feet of adhesive. So that's like five times more than the industry average right now. So is there is that the trend you see, uh, you know, moving forward? Will all the OEMs follow that at like that pace, or um, uh, you know, or is this like extreme examples? I don't think it's an extreme example at all. I would say that. Um, I agree. I, I I don't think it's an extreme example at all. I, I think that the benefits of adhesives, just in general, um, being able to dissipate stress, like we, we both talked about, across a whole body structure, being able to lightweight vehicles in this way, being able to mix the materials, just in general, right? Um, those benefits are so great that they can't be ignored. And I see that maybe not everything's going to have, you know, five or 600 meters of bottom line, but it's definitely going to increase its usage uh, because we are, you know, we're all getting pushed for lighter and lighter weight vehicles to uh, increase the uh, gas mileage. Okay. Um, bro, Dalton? Just, just to touch on that. Yeah, just to touch on that too. Um, everything is, uh, as we know, is going either electric or hybrid. And we all know how big those battery packs are in the vehicles. So a lot of that adhesive, uh, you know, you need a lot to seal those big modules and, and packs. So that's also where where those numbers might be coming from for the amount of, of adhesive that's in the vehicle. Right. So, uh, you know, a question that is related to that. Now, if you have so much adhesive, 400 to 600 feet of adhesive in a vehicle, and so what about the wear and tear of adhesives? And then if you need to repair these vehicles in ordinary body shops, uh, you know, will they require special equipment, special training? Uh, and what is the industry doing to solve these issues? I know we have, we are on the BMW 7 Series, right? We, one of the first vehicles. I know we actually purchased a vehicle that had over 130,000 miles on it, as well as, and then brought it back into the shop and unfortunately tore it all down and then looked at the bond strength and bond uh, integrity. And it looked as good or as the day it was uh, put on. Uh, we see that the wear and tear on the adhesive joint is, uh, is, is very, very good. We see that the the performance of the adhesive over time is uh, very, very well. It holds up very well and even way better than a mechanical fasteners and welding. Hmm. So I, I see that as, as as a good thing, right? Where all adhesive technology is not the easiest thing to do, but it is the best thing to do to really stiffen the car for the long term. And it really provides long term uh, stiffness for a vehicle. 
Brooke Dalton, do you have? Uh, do you want to add anything? Yeah, I mean, structural uh, adhesives, uh -huh. uh, as we know, are are very. Yeah, go, go ahead, Brooke. You can you can go. Oh no, that's fine. No, I was just I was just going to mention. I mean, you know, agreeing with with um, everything that's been said as well. But we also have um, with our adhesives, there's um, additional options that are made to correlate. So if there is damage to the vehicle, we have an adhesive that is meant for that repair for that specific application as well. So we have that that means to support it as well in terms of repair. Yeah, I agree, right? There's there's a whole Roy a world of repair adhesives that is necessary for these type of things. And they do provide the a little bit of uh, help for the body shops. So, you know, we have a, a nice portfolio of aftermarket type adhesives. Um, we you get, really get to build off our expertise in the uh, aftermarket window repair, you know, which is everybody unfortunately has to go through. Um, so it's uh, it's something we think about up front, right? And uh, being able to put those uh, highly performing adhesives easily appliable in like a body shop or a repair shop. Okay. Um, and okay, this particular question is for Henkel. Um, and it's on your alliance with R.A. Lee. Um, so first, can you just uh, briefly talk about what was your motivation behind uh, this alliance, and uh, is this uh, is this open to other companies, or is it only between Hankel and R.A. Lee? Um, sure, I can, I can take that one. Um, so, I mean, really the motivation there was to really capitalize on our, our strengths. I mean, we both are coming um, together to really support each other in, in those means. Um, with Hinkle, we, we have that expertise in terms of chemical formulation and chemical expertise. We also have products that we design ourselves in terms of components that support um, MBH or acoustic baffles and tapes, um, as well as you know, now with these structural inserts, we're seeing where we can truly capitalize on that design. Um, really, it was a way to help support both of us to enhance both of our capabilities and being able to provide that strength, as well as really optimizing on the need for simulation. I mean, we're seeing this really start to grow, especially within the startup community where we're utilizing our simulation capabilities to be that much more effective in our design. Um, there's no longer that historical platform in terms of how we should move forward like we see with the traditional OEM. So because of that, because of the, the high need for simulation data, material cards, and being able to have um, fast turnaround times, fast speed, and strong engineering expertise, we saw this as a great opportunity to come together and really exploit our capabilities, really be able to help generate this next level of design for our customers. Um, and in regards to the second question, I, I'm not sure I fully understand, but um, what, what I will say is how it works is, you know, we, we come together, um, Hankel and RLE, in terms of the specific application. Um, we have quite a few projects right now where we are working together, reviewing different applications, different designs, working together on different programs, and collectively collaborating, like I talked about in that study, um, to really optimize those designs. Hmm. Yeah, I, th I think the question was more about: Are you looking for more partners? Um, well, that's—I <laughs> am not sure of that one. Okay. Um, okay, I think uh, we have just one or two minutes on the clock, so I will just ask you to briefly, you know, conclude and uh, just add, uh, say some. Uh, some conclusion, uh, whatever you have presented, and then if you want to add something new. So, um, Arthur, do you want to go first? Uh, I'd just like to say thank you, everyone, for uh, joining this. Uh, it is a quite a, a fertile field uh, for uh, lightweighting the vehicle, gaining structure. Um, like my colleagues from Henkel say, you know, being up front in the development is makes it a lot easier for everyone, right? We're going to be able to get the most bang for our buck 
uh, for performance as well as uh, throughput too. You'd be able to, if you can integrate some of your solutions up early, you can get them out and cheaper. And that's why we usually, lighter, faster, cheaper is always better. So thank you very much. And uh, thanks to my friends at Hankel. Thanks, Arthur. Hankel? Yeah. And then uh, going off kind of what Arthur said, it's, it's, it's important to get us in early. Um, we can help you design your flange for your structural bonds if you want to use adhesive uh, for your application. So that's, that's, the, that's the big thing that, that I would say to, to conclude is that make sure you, you get us in early so we can help you with your initial design phases. Um, and then once again, thank, thanks everyone for your time and, and listening into this webinar. Okay, so be before we end, uh, I have just one more important question, which is very dear to Car, is on talent. Now, uh, you know, we are we are seeing a lot of different materials being used in the car, and now a lot of different joining technologies to support it and other enablers. Uh, what are your recommendations for the industry or say academia uh, to to prepare the you know? Uh, prepare the students for what's coming in automotive. Sure, I'll take that one. Um, I think what's really important in terms of talent and preparation, we're starting to see a lot more of movement in terms of you know computer, um, either with simulation, computer science, computer engineering. Um, I think that having a strong you know coding background, a strong understanding of what's happening with technology because it's moving so quickly, we're seeing this need for continual learning. Um, more so, I think, implementing a mentality you know, into the next generation and, and to enable success is that it's all about continuous learning. Uh, it's all about adapting as we learn and being that much more effective moving forward. Um, but really focusing in on, on the technical side in terms of computer science, engineering, um, chemistry, chemical engineering, um, these really offer, you know, great opportunities in terms of the future. And as we start to move with AI, um, it's important to keep renewing that learning capability and, and that technical expertise. Yeah, sure. Yep. There's a very yeah. I agree. I, and I, I think, you know, having an open mind, right? A lot of times we run into a lot of problems where, oh, we've always done it this way and we don't want to be open to new solutions, right? The, those are the ones that really pay off in the end. Okay, uh, that, this, this was a great webinar and thank you everybody for presenting and those of who, who were listening for your time as well. And um, hopefully we will do another webinar in, in next month or so. So stay connected and um, you know, I will I will share the contact information of our uh, of our presenters, and the recording of this webinar will be available on our website. So, if you want to refer it or want to share it with somebody else, feel free to do that. And with that, uh, thank you very much, and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Arthur. Bye bye. All right. Bye. Thank you, guys. Bye bye. bye, -bye.